And today he will tell us more about JSON schemas. Thank you, Julian. You guys hear me okay? Good. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me. It's good to be here. Uh, this is me on whichever parts of the internet you might want to find me. Uh, GitHub, Twitter, if you really feel like it. Uh, if you're on IRC in the Python channel, this is not awkward. <laughs> yeah, OK, we're good now. So it's just like going to the doctor. Oh, still hear me? No, maybe yeah, not. They do. They do. So I just put the thing, the yeah. thing around your ears. So, OK, we have an hour. It'll take me a half hour to get this on. OK, now good. Still hear me? Good. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if you're on IRC, first of all, I recommend being in the Python IRC channel if you're not already. It's a good place to learn stuff. Uh, if you have been in there, you probably interacted with me. I spend way too much time in there. Um, uh, I work for a company called Magnetic. We're an advertising marketing company. Uh, offices in like New York and San Mateo, London, uh, and Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, we use Python in production, PyPy in production for like the past two, two and a half years. Uh, like 70 engineers, we're including, recruiting obviously like everyone else. Um, talk to me if you want to talk about like, uh, you know, running PyPy at a high scale if you feel interested in that sort of stuff, which you should. Um, and uh, yeah, obviously I have to thank my company for sending me here. This is my second time at PyCon Italy. Uh, and I like it a lot, obviously. So, <clears throat> JSON schema. Uh, so feel free to interrupt me uh, during the talk. There'll be, I hope, some time. We have a full hour, so there should be some time at the end for questions. But uh, if you have questions as we go, just uh, shout them out or raise your hand or however you'd like. Uh, if I say something that's not clear, stop me. Uh, there's plenty of time, I hope, for, uh, for going slow. Uh, so how many people have ever heard of uh, JSON schema? OK, very good. Uh, and uh, how about the library? How many people have ever actually used the library? OK, very good. That's a nice difference between number of people heard of the specification and used the library. So uh, I hope everybody, including the people who have used the library already, um, will learn uh, a couple of things. Um, so uh, is there anyone in here who has not heard of JSON? Exactly what I expected. So. <laughs> So uh, just for posterity's sake, right? JSON is like a, uh, it's a data format. Uh, it's a way of expressing structured data. Um, and because it's uh, for various reasons, including that it's uh, fairly human readable and somewhat compact, especially if you compress it, um, people use JSON to represent data. And then they kind of serialize it into JSON and send JSON across the network, you know, all of these fun things. Um, <clears throat> so here's a JSON document. It's rep representing some sort of structured data you know, where we are at the conference. Um, <clears throat> and uh, one uh, problem, or at least a uh, thing that people were trying to solve with JSON is um, <clears throat> we have ways of representing our data. And now, anytime you have ways of representing data, someone's going to come along at some point and say, I need a way to actually represent what the schema is for this particular data, so that someone who's using it uh, is actually going to know, you know what types of values to expect. And out of that comes JSON schema. Uh, I'm sure there were other attempts before. Um, but JSON schema is uh, attempt at basically being able to define schemas for JSON documents. Uh, and JSON schema, uh, apologies for the confusion, because I'll say JSON schema for the specification. And uh, sort of it's a cross-language specification, which you can use across languages, which is one of the um, major reasons that you might uh, be interested in it. Uh, but I'll also say uh, JSON schema, hopefully I'll try to say the library, uh, to refer to um, this library, which I wrote, which has been out for a couple of years now. Um, uh, thankfully, very popular. There's a bunch of people that use it, uh, I think, at fairly large uh, deployments. Um, so you can find it on GitHub. Uh, but uh, we'll be talking about. Um, kind of using this library to validate and define JSON schemas. Uh, so let's uh, kind of jump right in. Um, <clears throat> so a bit of terminology. Can everyone see that? I realize it's probably a little bit small. Maybe we can bump it up a little bit. But uh, the little tiny text at the bottom in the back, good. 
Um, <clears throat> so just to get some common terminolo ter terminology, um, <clears throat> on the left there, we call that the instance. Uh, it's the thing that you're going to want to validate. On the right is the schema. So here's our first JSON schema. Uh, it's saying that the instances that we want to validate should be integers. Um, so there's uh, this thing called a validator. Uh, in this case, we're using the type validator, which checks types. Um, at a Python conference, uh, we should feel a bit weary about saying we check types. But for things that are coming over the network, let's say we're perfectly happy making sure that we got the types that we expect. Um, so we want to make sure that our instances are all integers. That's the schema for doing so. So far, so good. Um, <clears throat> across this entire talk, I'll mostly be talking only about uh, the parts of JSON schema that deal with validation. So there's a whole bunch of uh, validators that deal with validation. And then there's a couple of validators that do other things um, and uh, kind of like tie together JSON schema into a hypertext. I won't be talking at all about that, but you can talk to me about it afterwards if you really want to know about it. Um, but one thing you'll notice right away about the schema is it's just JSON, right? So we're using JSON uh, in some defined language uh, of the JSON schema specification. Uh, so we created a JSON document, and that JSON document specifies the schema for a class of JSON values. So it's just JSON. Um, so here's our first example of how we actually use this thing. Um, <clears throat> so sort of the, the most uh, straightforward or uh, direct way uh, of just having an instance, having a schema, and validating the instance under the schema is there's this like global function that you can just import and call. Uh, it takes as arguments the instance and the schema. So if you pass in uh, instance 42 schema type integer, uh, and then you hit enter, absolutely nothing happens uh, because this function, if the schema is valid, does nothing. Sorry, if the instance is valid, does nothing. Uh, so since 42 is perfectly fine, it's an integer, um, this is going to do nothing. Uh, I would type it into a terminal, but I assume that you believe me at this point, so we'll do some more exciting things in there. Uh, so of course, right after we, um, right after we have our first valid example, why not uh, see how things blow up? Because blowing up is fun. Uh, so here we have an instance, uh, which is clearly not going to validate under the schema. It's not an integer. Uh, if you pass this into the same place, uh, so you pass in that string uh, with that schema, it's going to tell you a couple of things. Um, so we'll go through these kind of tracebacks uh, in a bit more detail as we go, uh, but just to, just to kind of point, point out a couple of things. So first of all, it's telling you um, <clears throat> the most kind of high-level thing it can tell you is just that 42 is not an integer. Um, so when you get a validation error, you're going to see uh, on, on the same line as the exception, you're going to see um, uh, sort of a human readable message that says why, you know, what, you know, what, what just happened, what went wrong. Uh, and then it's going to tell you a little bit more. Uh, in this particular case, it's not that useful yet. But uh, if your instance is more complicated or your schema is more complicated, it's going to get very useful. Um, so it's telling you it failed while it was validating the type validator uh, in this schema, type integer. And the instance it was validating was this. Um, and you'll see, if you watch that area of the trace, traceback as we see a couple of more of those, uh, you'll see that it gets a bit more useful uh, if you have slightly more uh, interesting examples than this one. Um, so yeah, validate function, it takes an instance and a schema. Either nothing happens, meaning everything's valid, or you get a trace back, which means uh, something's wrong. Um, so you can imagine kind of like uh, you're handling web requests, and you're getting data that's coming in from a user. Uh, you stick this on the data that you get from a user, and you either catch the exception and uh, return some response to the user that says the data that you gave me was invalid. Uh, or if everything goes fine, you just kind of proceed knowing that the data that you got was valid. Make sense? Any questions so far? No? Good. Easy parts. Um, so let's talk kind of very broadly. What are the kinds of things that we can validate? Um, <clears throat> so we saw types. That's the simplest one. Uh, there are like seven basic types. There's like uh, whatever types basically exist in JSON. Uh, and then also there is a type called integer, which doesn't exist. Sorry. Yeah, which doesn't exist uh, as a type, um, but uh, which exists in JSON schemas. You can say, I have a number. It better be an integer. Um, so like strings, floats, arrays, objects, uh, uh, whatever else I missed. Um, and uh, when, I, when I talk about JSON, I'll try to use the JSON types, so array instead of list. And then when I talk about Python, I'll talk about lists. Uh, 
Um, but you can validate all of those types. Uh, ranges, size, and lengths, right? So if you have some type of container, uh, you can validate that it's of a certain length uh, or that it uh, is a certain size. Um, so if you have a list, you can if you have an array, you can validate that it's at least n elements or at most n elements. Or if you have a string, you can say how long the string should be. Uh, if you have an object, you can say how many properties it should have. Uh, container contents. So if you again, if you have a container, you can say what the schemas of its contents need to be. Excuse me. Um, form. Uh, you can if you have a uh, if you have a kind of like simple type like an integer or a string, um, you can say stuff about what the form of that object should be. So you can say things like this integer should be divisible by seven. Uh, or if you have a string, you, should, you can say this string should uh, validate against this particular regular expression. Um, so there are validators for saying that. Uh, and then higher order operators, uh, which we'll talk about later, which are like Boolean combinations of other operators. So uh, let's start getting a little bit more exciting, I guess. Um, so back to our instance before, we're looking to potentially define a schema for this instance. Uh, on the next slide will be way more code. Uh, or way more things than I generally like to put on a slide, but uh, don't get too uh, frightened. It's not hard to read, I hope. So here is a schema for that particular document. So let's try to read this from top to bottom somewhat slowly. So first of all, we're saying type object. We expect objects. This thing is an object. Uh, properties is a validator that lets you say, uh, tell me the names of all the properties that are going to be inside your object. And for each property, if it's there, then this is the schema that it needs to have. So this is saying properties. Uh, so there should be a property in there called name, uh, and it has to be a string. There should be a property in there called location, or there could be a property in there called location. And if it's there, it should be an array. Um, description is just kind of metadata. Uh, there's, no, there's no validation that it does, so it's just describing to someone reading this schema what it is. Uh, but it, it does say that its items need to follow this uh, format. Uh, which is uh, first object needs to be first item in the array needs to be an integer at least negative 90 at most 90 and second one at least negative 80 and at most 180 because theoretically this object that we have here is trying to give us like latitude and longitude and those are the valid ranges for latitude and longitude um, so this is our schema uh, and it roughly with you know some room for adding additional constraints if you really feel like it it roughly defines what uh, valid objects potentially are for this particular um, range of documents. Okay? Questions on this schema? One. What's your name? Ah, sorry. Can you say your name? I am Giovanni. Giovanni. I'm guessing e um, latitude and longitude shouldn't be integer. Ah, floats. Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> Congrats, you found the mistake on the slides. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, yes, definitely correct. Uh, yes, so surprise, like many other schema formats, they definitely can validate your instance, but the schema can't tell you whether you wrote the schema correctly. <laughs> uh, so I did not. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, uh, so now, uh, slight interlude. Uh, if you're paying somewhat pedantic attention, you might notice that uh, the name JSON schema is a bit of a lie. Uh, really, it should be called Python schema, because JSON schema, uh, like JSON is text, right? J uh, like the Python representation of JSON is a string, uh, like a, a piece of Unicode, most likely. Um, so JSON schema, the library, does not in fact validate JSON at all. It validates the types of objects that you get by deserializing JSON in Python. So you, like. The Python int 42 is something that you would potentially get from deserializing a piece of JSON text with 42 in it. Um, but in fact, like you can completely ignore the fact that all of the values that you're going to be validating generally come from JSON. If you really feel like it, you can just use it to validate Python objects. Um, again, I wouldn't recommend that you, for, say, like type check a bunch of random Python objects uh, if they didn't come off the wire. But uh, just a slight note of uh, pedantry while we're in the area. So <clears throat> um, there's an instance on the left. Uh, it's an array with the integer 1. There's a schema on the right which says uh, that this instance on the left is particularly 
uh, a pro pro problematic. So this scheme on the right says that what we should have are uh, arrays. You don't necessarily have to include a type validator. Uh, if you don't, actually, uh, the behavior is perhaps not necessarily obvious. So if you don't say that you're expecting arrays, uh, an object will pass this schema, because items only applies to arrays. So if you put items in there and you don't even pass in an array, it's going to be valid unless you say type array. But I didn't include it. So this means basically uh, the items of my array should have a schema of type Boolean. So I'm expecting an array of Booleans uh, with at least two items in the array. So arrays of at least length two uh, that contain Booleans. And obviously, this thing on the left is not such a thing. Uh, in fact, there are multiple th reasons why it doesn't actually satisfy this schema on the right. Um, <clears throat> Let's introduce this object called a validator uh, object, which is basically a way of having a schema and then using it over and over again. So unlike the validator function before, which basically just secretly wraps one of these guys, uh, I'm going to create my own, pass in the schema that I'm going to want to keep validating with, uh, and then I can just keep reusing it. So we'll have a couple of examples. Um, but you just kind of create one of these guys, pass in your schema, and then you can call the same methods that you did before. So just like there's a global function called validate, there's also a method on this object called validate. And if I pass it a bunch of like valid instances, true false is an array of at least length two containing Booleans, and another one, an array at least containing two with Booleans. Um, again, same, same API, uh, nothing happens. You hit enter, everything validates successfully. Uh, <clears throat> again, same as before, if you pass in the array that we just had, it's going to tell you one is not of type Boolean. Uh, failed validating type in schema. Now it's going to tell you it was validating the sub part of your schema. Uh, so your, your whole schema before had multiple properties in it, but it was validating schema uh, index items, uh, which is a schema that says type Boolean. And it was validating instance 0, which means the first, array, first uh, element inside the instance. So instance 0 was a 1, and it's telling you that's not a Boolean. So you certainly do get a validation error. Uh, it's telling you like the, the array that you passed in has an item 1 in it, and that's not a uh, Boolean, so that instance isn't valid. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry. Um, but that's not good enough. Well, certainly, potentially, it's not good enough. Um, imagine that I'm uh, serving out some response to a browser, and someone's typing in stuff into a form. It would be kind of annoying if the person was typing something into a form, and the thing that they typed in had 300 errors in whatever they typed in. Uh, but each time that the user sends me a, a potential input, I validate one error, and then I respond back and say, no, that's a problem. And they have to do that 299 times in order to actually fix all the problems in their form. So what happens if I want to see all the problems with the particular uh, instance that was passed in? So there's this method called iter errors, which returns back to you basically an uh, iter, uh, iterable containing all of the errors uh, that were wrong with the particular uh, instance. So if, again, I pass in this array containing the number 1, now I get basically a bunch of objects uh, that have on them a dot .message attribute. And if I pull that off, uh, you'll see that there's basically two uh, errors, and their message is 1 is not a Boolean, and the array containing 1 is too short. So there were two problems with that particular instance. There they are, and those are the messages for them. <coughs> Excuse me. So far, so good? Other questions? OK. And there's a lot of stuff that you can actually introspect uh, about errors. Uh, here's a bunch of uh, kind of broad categories. We'll t touch on some of these a little bit more. Uh, but roughly, there's kind of like three categories that you can introspect for uh, when an error happens. Uh, like what information can I get kind of programmatically about what the error was. Um, so first of all, there's that human readable message that we saw, uh, which is kind of like what happened. Like I, I need to be able to show to a developer, not a user, a developer needs to be able to see like what was the raw problem that occurred in this particular um, case. Uh, there's a class of things which are like, OK, so why did that thing happen, um, which we'll see in a little bit when we talk about um, higher order validators. And then there's a class of things that was uh, talking about basically, OK, so what were we validating when the error occurred? So that's where in the instance, where in the schema, uh, which particular validator were we validating, and what was the value for that particular validator, which is basically all the information that you need to know in order to know 
what validator was doing what at what time. Um, so you don't have to memorize this, obviously. We'll touch on a couple more of these in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> one thing that's also uh, potentially useful, although, um, well, there were two in here that say they've used the library, but uh, in all the time I've, that, the that the library has existed, I don't think I've ever seen anyone use this uh, in actual code. Maybe people use it uh, uh, privately when they're debugging, but there's this object called an error tree. Um, so let's see if we can see what this object is doing. Um, so an error tree is an object that just takes a bunch of errors, which is what iter errors returns. So you can just pass in the errors from uh, iter errors on our instance. Sorry, I realize this color is probably a bit hard to see uh, with all the lights on, but that's the same instance as before. Um, <clears throat> and if we, uh, if we kind of uh, take this error tree, we can pretty much explore it uh, as if it was our instance. So the interpretation of this is basically the tree is tree zero corresponds to the zeroth uh, offset in our instance, which was that number one. And if we just go down to zero, tree zero, and look at the errors at that point, it's going to tell you that at tree zero, there was an error for the type validator. Uh, and here's the error object, which says one is not a Boolean, which means basically you can imagine that the tree is your instance and you indexed into your instance. Uh, and it's telling you that at that index of your instance uh, was this uh, validation error. And if there are multiple, obviously, there will be multiple in there. Make sense? Um, so you can kind of like walk around your instance uh, or walk around something that parallels your instance and just kind of query the errors at any particular um, point inside your, in your instance. Uh, any questions on this? Good. Uh, so if you have nested uh, instances, uh, you would be able to do tree zero, uh, and then if there was an object, you can do tree zero foo dot errors or whatever. <clears throat> okay. Uh, references. So uh, we're all uh, good programmers. Um, as soon as we start talking about being able to define things, uh, as all good programmers, we're going to want to start to give names to things. So here's an example. <coughs> um, we're going to have here an object that we're going to want to validate. And it contains kind of three different types of names. Uh, maybe there's a, a full name, and then a nickname, and then a username. So there's a document with three properties. Uh, all of these things are strings, and all of them should be at least one character, because who has an empty name? Um, <coughs> so there's a bit of repetition here, obviously. So like all good programmers, we want to remove that repetition. So that's what references are for. Um, here's examples of references. So um, the dollar sign ref is kind of a special looking syntax. It means I'm about to give you a reference. It means that the schema for this name property is actually at that reference. Uh, and references are just kind of like uh, URIs. Um, and uh, this type of URI is called a JSON pointer. Uh, basically, it means the dollar sign is the document itself. So this URI basically means the name uh, schema is at the reference me slash definition slash name like. So if we resolve that, this is our document. Then it says slash definitions, which is here. Then it says slash name like, which is here. And then this is our schema. Clear? Um, so now we're able to say, basically, for all three of those names, which I, of course, spelled one wrong, which he was going to point out in a second. Uh, <coughs> so all three of these names have a schema of this, uh, but we defined their schemas by reference. And why is that good? It's good for the same reasons that uh, kind of levels of ab abstraction or naming are always good in programming, which is basically like someone's going to come along in two weeks from now and say, like, hey, uh, Jimmy keeps typing in names that are like the entire uh, like war and peace. And so probably we should put in a limit to how long names could be, because there's no reason someone should have a name that's like 10 gigs long. So someone's going to come, come along and add like max length 4,096. Uh, and so if, if you defined your references by name, uh, now this basically new constraint applies to all three. And someone didn't forget to kind of like update uh, all of the names to make sure that the new change that they wanted to make applied to all of them. So anytime 
Uh, just like you know, when writing some Python code, if you realize that some things should be related and kept together, you define a function. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, same thing here. If you have a bunch of things that you think are going to be related and they should basically uh, be defined together, uh, you define a reference, and then someone can come along and basically maintain the reference on its own. Um, and again, references are URIs, so this is just one example. URLs, URIs. Um, this is just one example uh, of the type of reference you can have, but you can stick a URL there, uh, like a HTTP URL is what I mean now. Um, so you can stick an HTTP URL in there, and that basically means this reference lives at this URL, uh, and it will go off and retrieve that um, particular uh, thing that lives at that URL and use that as the schema. Um, so let's give an example uh, of uh, something slightly different, but we'll come back to references in a minute. Um, so someone comes to you and says, I want to be able to define a schema for non-empty sequences. So a sequence is the same uh, definition, let's say, as sequence in Python. Um, so a sequence would be, let's say, uh, strings and arrays. OK, that's pretty easy. Um, like I mentioned before, uh, validators, certain validators only apply to particular types. So you can just kind of like mix them together, um, which is uh, either a bit strange uh, or bad or fantastic and convenient, depending on your perspective. I won't give any. Um, so here's a schema that basically says, I'm expecting either uh, a string or an array. Uh, min items only applies to arrays. So you say min items one means non-empty array. Min length only applies to strings, so you say min length one, that means non-empty string. And this schema basically implements non-empty sequence. So far so good? Uh, now someone comes to you and says, OK, uh, non-empty sequence was good, but now we need a schema for a moniker, a name, or an alias. So here's an example, just in case that wasn't clear, which I'm sure it wasn't. Spoilers if you haven't seen Batman versus Superman. So either they want. Uh, an S, uh, or they want a document that says someone's name is Clark Kent, or they want a document that says someone's alias is Superman. One of these three things, all of them should be valid uh, for this particular input. So how do we write a schema that basically allows any of these three uh, documents, or any of these three types of inputs? Um, so nothing that we've seen so far can do that, um, but we did mention uh, higher, higher order validators, um, so let's use those. So um, there's a validator called one of. <coughs> Man, excuse me. Um, so one of is a validator that does exactly what it says. It means I'm going to give you a bunch of schemas, and then the instance uh, that you give me has to validate uh, against exactly one of the schemas that you give me. So it can't be zero. It can't be two or more. Exactly one of the schemas that you give me has to validate against it. Uh, and here we're using references again. So we're basically translating the request pretty much exactly as it was given to us. This schema is going to say, I need the instance to be one of either a moniker or a name or an alias. Uh, and on the next slide, we'll look at the definitions for those three. But basically, this is the literal translation of that request. There's a validator that just kind of corresponds exactly to, I need one of these three things, or one of any n things. Clear? So here's our definitions. Again, there's a lot on this slide, but it's kind of not very um, scary, I don't think. So um, the definition for a moniker will be it's a string, and it has to match the regular expression pattern, capital letter, at least one or more. Uh, a name will be an object. Uh, required is the name of a validator that says the property has to be there, because remember, properties are not required by default. So if you want something to be required, you put it in there. Um, so name is required, uh, and then properties, name, uh, and it has to be a string. So that's our uh, schema for objects with names. And then our schema for objects with aliases is the same, just name instead of just alias instead of name. Um, so now this thing is basically our entire schema. So if you combine the one of, which says one of these three things, with the actual definitions for what those things are, um, now we have a schema that basically validates either those capital letter things or uh, objects with name properties, or objects with alias properties. Make sense? <clears throat> so what happens when we use these things? Um, so if you pass in something valid, it'll work. 
Um, but if we pass in something invalid, something kind of interesting happens, uh, which is worth pointing out. So I passed in here the empty string, um, which doesn't satisfy any of those three things, right? It's, uh, it doesn't satisfy one or more capital letters. It's not an object with a name property, and it's not an object with an alias property. When you validate this thing, the error that you get just tells you, like, empty string is not valid and under any of the given schemas. Um, and it'll tell you what it was doing. It says, failed validating one of in schema. There's the schema. Lots of lines in there because this entire thing was being validated. Um, but it was validating this, um, this schema here um, on instance empty string. Which is true, right? Like, empty string is not valid under any of those uh, schemas. Uh, again, if you go to that iter errors method that we saw before, which is basically going to tell you, tell me all the errors that we had, there's actually just one error in there, um, because every, every error corresponds exactly to one validator. So there's a one of validator, and that one of validator generated one error, uh, which was basically just no. Uh, like. The one of is saying, you have to be at least one of these. And the answer was no, so that's an error. Uh, but again, that's not good enough, right? Like, if you have a one of with 15 things in it, which I wouldn't recommend that you do, but just in case that you do, uh, if there's 15 things in there, I don't just want to know it's not valid under any of those 15 things. It would be nice to be able to know um, kind of like for each thing in there, what was the reason why the, uh, that particular schema wasn't valid for my instance, or my instance wasn't valid for that particular branch of the one of. Um, and like we'll see in a couple of slides, uh, it would also kind of be nice to know, like, okay, like, tell me the most likely thing, the most likely reason that my instance is wrong. Like, just guess and like, tell me what's the most likely thing that I need to fix. So let's address each of those things. So the first one is um, this attribute called context, which we talked about way before in that big list of properties. So context basically means something pretty similar, uh, something pretty easy. Um, <clears throat> if you have an error, uh, like the one error that we have there, which says not valid under any of the given schemas. The context attribute for any higher order uh, validator, like one of or any of or all of, which are the three of them that we'll, um, that we'll mention, um, context has in it one error per branch in the one of. So there were three branches in our one of. It said either a moniker or a name or an alias. In here is one error for each of the branches. So this is why you didn't satisfy branch one, which was um, Moniker, it says because it doesn't match capital letter plus. Uh, so it doesn't match that regex. That's why you didn't satisfy that branch of the one of. The second one says it's not an object because it failed the type validator in, um, in the branch for name. And same thing, it failed the type validator for the branch for alias. Um, so this gives you basically one branch for each of those three um, schemas inside the one of. Does it make sense? Questions? Any? No. Good. Um, and again, it would be a bit nice if, like, just guess what the most likely error is. Um, and for that, there's a function called best match. Um, best match actually, again, also takes a bunch of errors. Uh, and then it returns back to you the error which it thinks heuristically is basically the most likely reason for why your instance failed. Um, so in this case, what we're passing in is iter errors of the empty string, which is that same. Uh, list of one error that we saw before, or iterable of one error that we saw before. Uh, what it's doing is actually recursing inside that error, picking from one of the branches, and then giving you the error that it thinks is most likely to be relevant, um, which I hope everyone will agree in this particular case. It's most likely that someone who passed in that input probably meant to pass in a moniker, but didn't pass in a long enough string. So it's telling you it doesn't match A to Z plus and hiding the rest of the errors from you. Um, so just to point it out, there's, uh, there's kind of like three different um, mechanisms for deciding when something goes wrong, which are like, what do I want to see? There's the validate method slash function, which we talked about originally, which basically means stop when you find the first one. I just want to know, yes, it's valid, or no, it's not valid. Uh, and I'm OK with basically short circuiting as soon as you find one error. There's iter errors, which we saw, which basically means give me all of them. So keep, keep processing the instance and tell me all the errors one at a time. And then there's best match, which basically means still process all the errors, then pick, pick out the one that's most likely to be relevant. Um, and it's not on the slides, although I can demo it after. But there's also actually a key function um, for everyone who's familiar with the uh, key argument to like sort it or dot sort on collections. Um, there's, a, there's a function that you can pass in called relevance, uh, 
uh, which if you have a, a iterable of errors and you pass it into sorted, you can say sorted, iter errors something, key equals relevance, and it will basically sort that list based on what it thinks are the most relevant errors, and then you can do with them as you'd like. Um, Uh, okay, let's talk about format, unless anyone uh, has any questions on that topic. Good. Um, so we talked a little bit about form. Uh, format is a way of basically taking uh, simple objects like strings, integers, floats, uh, and defining uh, properties for how they should look. So here's one example. Uh, I want to be able to accept strings, uh, but I want strings with format date. Um, Date here uh, is defined as a format, is defined by the specification to be a format that basically means, I think, ISO 8601 dates. Um, or no, sorry, it's just year, month, day. Um, <clears throat> so uh, by default, actually, the format uh, property or the format validator doesn't actually do any validation. It's kind of just as informative as description. It's like for signaling to someone who's reading the schema what the format should be, not really for doing validation. But if you do want it to do validation, there is an object you can plug in, and it will basically cause the format validator to do validation. Um, so it's an object called format checker. So you import it. Uh, we pass in this second parameter to the validator objects that we've been creating all along. Um, so we pass in the same schema, or that schema that we just saw on the last slide, and we pass in this new object called the format checker. And if we do that, um, and we validate this thing, which is not a date. It's going to tell you validation error 2014-01 is not a date. Here's the schema it was validating. There's the instance it was validating. Very familiar traceback, same as we saw before. And you can define your, your own uh, formats if you'd like. So imagine, for whatever bizarre reason, you want to be able to define uh, a schema that says that you accept integers and they have to be prime. Um, so assuming that you have some existing prime checking function like Miller-Rabin, um, you can create uh, a format checker. Uh, there's this uh, function on there called uh, checker.checks, which basically you decorate a function. And you say, this function is the checker that actually checks to make sure things are of format prime. Um, and then you define your function. It takes one value, uh, which is just going to be true or false. Uh, I'm just kind of calling out to this function that I have already. Um, and if you do this and you plug in that format checker to your validator, you can basically say, now, format prime. Uh, and numbers that are prime will validate correctly. Numbers that are not prime will raise validation errors saying 8 is not a prime. Questions on that? Please. Can you say your name? Yeah, Michele. That depends on Booleans, or if that function raises an exception, then um, the will think fails. There's two APIs. Uh, so the. the uh, this one is making use of Booleans, returning true or false based on it's actually. And depending on that, I get the check with the validation error. And if I get uh, if I input a string to that function, then I have uh, another a value error, and that triggers a validation error or a value error. Uh, so uh, if you do nothing, it will trigger a value error. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a second argument to this function here that says the, where you can say comma raises equals, which is basically a tuple of exceptions. Uh, and if you pass in exceptions there, it will basically be the equivalent of a try except. Uh, so if you pass in uh, raises value error, uh, it will convert that to a validation error. Other questions? Was there a hand? I saw someone. No. OK. Uh, <coughs> meta schemas. OK. Uh, a couple minutes left. Uh, meta schemas are, uh, everyone likes talking about meta programming. Um, <clears throat> meta schemas are somewhat obvious, right? Uh, because our schemas are JSON, we can define schemas for the schemas in JSON. So here's a schema. Uh, it happens to be invalid because like, the type validator takes either a string or an array of strings. Um, so I passed in an object. Uh, if I call this method on validator's class method called check schema, what this means is basically take this schema and validate it against the meta schema. Uh, I'm not going to put the meta schema on the slide because uh, it would run off 10, uh, not 10, but it would run off like three slides. But if you call this method, um, at least the subsection of the traceback you'll get is this. It's telling you schema error, very familiar looking traceback. It's exactly the same. 
kind of uh, not so secret is basically like nothing special happens here. It just runs through the same code that validates instances against schemas, except now your schema is the meta schema. But here's a selection of the meta schema. So it's telling you failed validating any of in schema properties type. So schema there is the meta schema. It's telling you it was validating uh, in the meta schema the property, the type property, which is the schema that should apply to any of the type uh, properties inside schema. And the meta schema says that an any of, or, or sorry, that uh, the argument to type validators needs to be any of the following things. Either a simple type, which is one of those seven types I mentioned before. So you can either say type string or an array with at least one object in it with at least one element. Uh, all of them have to be unique. Uh, and each of the items have to be one of those simple types. So that, uh, that any of basically implements exactly the logic that I just described, which is either you tell me type string or you tell me type array string integer. Anything else is invalid. So it's telling you it was trying to validate that subsection of the schema on this uh, value inside your schema, which is an object. Uh, so that's not valid. So your schema is not valid. And of course, like I said, there's really nothing special going on here. If you really feel like it, you can create a validator object, pass in as your schema the meta schema, uh, which is just an attribute on every validator. Uh, and then you can use iter errors to get all the problems with the particular schema. So now I have a schema with uh, two problems in it. Uh, if I go through and iterate through iter errors for this particular schema, it's going to tell you error number one is that uh, minimum takes a number. And error number two is that that thing is not a, one of the valid uh, inputs for type. Clear? Uh, OK, I have one last um, kind of like little uh, live coding exercise, maybe. Um, before I do that, um, I'll uh, send out links to the slides, uh, maybe tweet them out, and probably they'll be available on the presentation, I'm sure. Um, but uh, just to go through these, so here's a bunch of resources that you might want to check out. The top one, you can install the library in uh, kind of the normal way. Um, <clears throat> this second thing is a tutorial on the specification. So if you go to this, this link, fourth link over here, that's the specification site. But it's kind of written in very typical uh, like uh, submission to the IETF form. So you might not necessarily find that to be the most approachable resource. Um, so this second link over here is more kind of like little hand-holdy, uh, typical tutorial uh, for teaching you how to write JSON schemas if you want to go a little bit slower or at your own pace. Um, this third link is the read the docs documentation for my library. Um, <clears throat> this fourth, one, uh, fifth link is uh, not necessarily of interest to people using the library, uh, but it's kind of just an interesting thing to look at. It's basically a cross-language specification, or sorry, a cross-language test suite that you can use to write JSON schema validators. So for example, um, you invented your own very cool language, uh, programming language, and you would like to be able to validate uh, JSON schema in your new programming language, uh, or in some language where it doesn't exist already. Um, this test suite is a bunch of JSON documents which basically say, here's an instance, here's a schema, is it valid, yes or no? If you pass all the tests of that test suite, your validator probably works, uh, your library probably works. Um, so I wrote most of that also, but uh, if you do write a validator, I would probably recommend that you, uh, that you run it under that because it is fairly comprehensive. Uh, and this bottom thing uh, is actually kind of cool. I'll show it. Um, yeah. I can actually type on this keyboard, which I can't clearly. And we're not on the internet, are we? Let's see. Uh, technical difficulties. Should be embarrassing that I don't know how to use Ubuntu, right? I think so. Uh, well, also it could be that the server's down. Let's find out. No, not connected. Uh, okay, well, uh, you can go on your own, uh, on your own, um, Computer, if you'd like, basically, uh, uh, now I can't get back into full screen either. Oh, well. Um, <clears throat> what this is is basically a fiddle. Uh, so if you're familiar with like JavaScript fiddle or any of the other fiddles, basically what it is is it will give you three boxes. Uh, 
uh, one box where you paste in schemas, one box where you paste in instances, and then it will let you kind of like play around in a web UI with, uh, with those things. Ah, thank you. Um, so maybe we'll go to it in a second. Uh, and then, yeah, like I said, uh, we can do a little live coding, uh, but I think maybe first we can stop for any questions at all on anything random. Uh, should we do that first? So uh, questions on anything? Uh, yes, let's go around the room, I guess. Uh, just say your name, please, first. Hi, my name is Pietro. Pietro. Uh, OK, I follow with interest your talk and uh, the yesterday talk about uh, another uh, validator named uh, Cerberus. Name what? Uh, Cerberus. Cerberus. Uh, okay. I haven't actually heard of that one. Yeah, I'm sorry. We'll go ahead. Yes. It, it's quite the same. Um, my my question. I um, before I uh, look uh, on the stack uh, on the stack overflow about uh, JSON schema, and uh, it's not really my ask question, but uh, uh, it's important for me to understand validation in Python. It's not a bit contrary with the philosophy of the, this language because uh, in Python it's easiest to ask uh, 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 permission. Uh, permission forgiveness. Yeah. It, it's not the contrary. Yes. Yes, fantastic question. Um, so there's a lot of ways to answer that question. Uh, I think the, ver the easiest way to answer that question, well, first of all, yes, I agree 100% uh, that uh, generally speaking in Python, um, I think maybe you mentioned, well, easier to ask for forgiveness, yes, but I think maybe the more relevant thing to invoke here is basically like we're all consenting adults. Like generally speaking, it's the responsibility of someone using your API to actually provide you the correct values, not, uh, not me protecting the person who's giving me values um, to make sure that the values are valid. So for example, if you have a function and it's supposed to take integers between 2 and 100, most likely you shouldn't actually check to make sure that the value someone gave you is between 2 and 100. Maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, there's better examples than this one, I guess. But if you just say in your documentation that someone should be giving you values in that range, usually that's enough. So yes, I agree. Um, there's a good blog post, though, for why, uh, for which use cases basically should not or potentially shouldn't fall into, um, into that uh, particular um, point that you just mentioned, uh, which, let's see, are we back online? No. no. Um, so I would, uh, I would uh, encourage you to uh, Google an article called Static on the Wire by Glyph, who's the author of uh, Twisted. Um, and basically, uh, one, one way to answer your question is to say um, the types of cases where you would want to use validation are when you're accepting input that's coming off the network, for example. Um, so, so once you're in Python land and you're passing objects around or you're writing a library that developers are using, yes, I, I would say you should always basically um, uh, let your caller take the responsibility of making sure what they're giving you is valid. Um, but there, there are other use cases which basically revolve around um, potentially untrusted uh, data coming in on the network or, or, or um, kind of users who aren't developers, basically, is the basic answer. So users who aren't developers, who aren't using your code as if it's a library, they're just passing you some data. And now you need a way to tell them, to inform them, basically, was the data that you gave me valid and I'm doing something with it? Or the data is not valid and I'm not doing something for it? Um, and those are the sorts of use cases where something like this will pop up, is when you're handling data that's coming in from the network from, from a user who's giving you data, um, and, you, uh, and you need to be able to tell them, yes, I'm accepting what you gave me, or no, I'm not accepting what you gave me. Um, within Python land, yeah, I wouldn't recommend that if you're creating a library uh, and you need to say, like, uh, you know, this, this function takes strings, I wouldn't recommend that you wrap that function with a thing that first validates it against type string. Uh, that's a bit of a short answer. I think the blog post maybe is a bit of a longer answer for other similar use cases, but it's, it's a good topic to discuss. Yeah? Got it. We're good. Uh, whoop. Okay. Uh, other questions? Yes, your name, sir. Ah, no, no. Okay, uh, I'm Andrea, and the question is this. Uh, the JSON string 99.0 is valid JSON. Yeah, but it is uh, now, actually. You know, it wasn't like a year ago. Okay, because uh, JSON was described to be an object. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah sorry. Okay, for, uh, for uh, 
for a field, that's, that's the same. But the problem is that uh, the JSON uh, parser will give you uh, a float. Yeah. And so won't validate against a schema with an integer. But instead, for example, the web, uh, uh, the web page validates. Yeah. So 99.0 is valid JSON for a schema with integer. So isn't this a problem for? Uh, yes, so there's an easy way around your problem. Uh, so remember the part where I said that JSON schema actually validates Python objects. So the, for example, the standard library JSON module um, has in there a bunch of hooks where you can plug in to define what the target Python data type is for particular bytes in JSON that it thinks are about to be afloat. So if in the JSON uh, module you pass in, uh, I think it's called float type, float underscore type. If you pass in argument float underscore type and you pass in the decimal dot decimal class, for example, you'll get decimals. If you pass in uh, some other type that you'd like to use instead of float, you'll get those objects. Um, if you're trying to, uh, so, so your question was about 99.0 being Yeah, the problem is that 99.0 is an integer. Yeah. But it so doesn't that, validate with JSON schema library. Yeah. So that I think is because you used it on the, that JSON schema.net uh, web page. That's probably because it's using a JavaScript uh, validator, and JavaScript doesn't ha only has one number type. So yes, it's a problem. It's a problem mostly for JavaScript, where it's always a problem. Like in JavaScript, you have no way of knowing like what's, what type of number this is. So yes, for JavaScript validators, they'll, they'll have issues distinguishing between the different number types. In Python, thankfully, we have no such issues, so we're, we're OK. Uh, and even if you want to be able to say things like uh, the visibility of a float, then you can use the thing I was talking about, about decimals to get fixed precision. Um, division for floats. So in Python, less of a problem. In JavaScript, more of a problem. But it's always a problem in JavaScript. It's not necessarily something specific to JSON schema. Does that make sense? OK. Any other questions? There was some hands back here, I think. Yeah, I remember, but I couldn't see it anymore. No. Perfect. Uh, was it this one? Kind of. Um, OK. Uh, so I, ha I have eight minutes. Uh, no. Or I have three minutes. Yeah, you have three minutes. Three minutes. And you have internet. And I have internet. Wow. Uh, OK. In three minutes, I will demonstrate something uh, which I did not. Uh, hold on. Uh, OK, assuming I can type properly. Uh, in three minutes, for anyone who would like, uh, I'll demonstrate something that I didn't actually show, uh, which is basically if out of all the things that I showed you, still there isn't something powerful enough to do whatever validation you'd like to do. There are functions in here called like create and extend. Extend means basically. Uh, extend means I have a validator. I want to create a new one with uh, some extra logic. So before I call this function, let's actually define uh, some validator. Uh, I think the last example I'm just going to pick myself because we only have two minutes. It's going to be a validator that's just going to tell us whether the instance that you validate against it is odd. Uh, of course, you can do this already by using multiple of two or whatever. Um, but for right now, I'm just going to define a function that takes arbitrary arguments and keyword arguments and prints them out. And if I call that function, so I'm going to extend. The validator that I'm going to extend is going to be the draft for a validator, which we've been using all along. And then the new validators that I'm going to provide are going to be one called odd, which is going to validate a validator called odd in a schema. And the function that validates it is going to be that odd function that we just defined. And if I do this, ah, what's happening here? Why am I getting open parentheses? OK, um, because I can't read. Uh, so out pops a class, uh, which is a class like the one that we've been using. I pass in type. Integer validate 12. See, that works just like before. If I pass in, oh, this is me being an American right now. 
Where's the quotes? We play the fun game. <laughs> well, let's do array instead. Nice keyboard, yeah. dude. It's uh, okay. Okay, so array. Uh, you see, we get an error. But now, if we actually pass in as our schema odd true, and now we validate. Uh, well, let's validate something that is valid. You see that that function that we passed in got called, and it got called with a couple of arguments. Uh, which I don't have time to explain or to redefine, but basically, validator that was doing the validation, the uh, the value that was in the schema, the instance that was being validated, and the schema that was being validated. So you can kind of just define your own uh, entire validator function and extend the validator class to actually implement it. Uh, you can obviously come talk to me if you feel like it afterwards. Uh, but thanks, everybody. Thank you.